due process, winner of 19 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights, and the 2011 Mid-Atlantic Emmy for outstanding discussion series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. I think that it hasn't been told for, for multiple reasons. One of them is that it, in some ways it was such a painful experience for the people who've been participating in this. There were six million African Americans who left the home of their of their ancestors and set out for all parts of this country, North, West, and Midwest. America's Great Migration. Six decades of flight from the Jim Crow South, a place where oppression and brutality reigned for a century after emancipation. A migration to places like Newark. Explored in painful detail in Isabel Wilkerson's extraordinary book. Up next, on Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. She calls it the most underreported story of the 20th century, the flight of six million black Americans from a South that had replaced slavery with a brutal caste system, not unlike South African apartheid. Actual laws designed to exploit, abuse, brutalize, and degrade based solely on race. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King, and with her groundbreaking book, The Warmth of Other Suns, Pulitzer Prize winner Isabel Wilkerson has ensured that anyone who really wants to know the terrors of Jim Crow, the daily humiliation of a cruelly and officially segregated South, the one barely mentioned even in our northern textbooks, now has somewhere to go, and it's somewhere really worth going. We thank Isabel Wilkerson on campus to accept an award at Douglas for coming here to the ITV studio and due process. Welcome, Isabel. Oh, great to be here. As a grandchild of the Great Migration, um, where it was talked about but never using that phrase, um, it struck me when I ran out and got your book right away, and I got it electronically, I have two versions of it, <laughs> that um, your analysis is that this is a story that hasn't been told even though it has dramatic impact as great as many other migratory stories. Is it just the fact that the participants were largely black? Is that why the story has been so untold and unanalyzed? I think that it hasn't been told for, for multiple reasons. One of them is that it, in some ways it was such a painful experience for the people who've been participating in this. There were six million African Americans who left the home of their, of their ancestors and set out for all parts of this country, North, West, and Midwest and many of them never looked back. They had endured such hardships and br brutality that they didn't even tell their own children about what they had endured. And so but when you think about that... scholars and others are in theory the ones who should tell those stories even if the participants find there is too much pain to tell it. Why do you think the academy and the larger intellectual public didn't focus on this before you really kick-started people to analyze and talk about it. What happened is that people didn't start looking at it until they started arriving in such large numbers and migration began in World War I. The great migration of so many people uh, began in World War I. And as a result of that, the attention was focused on what was happening in the cities upon their arrival, the fears of overcrowding, of disease, of all the things that they might be bringing. So the focus ended up being more on the pathologies that were imbued or attached to their arrival as opposed to what were they what were the le reasons for their leaving? What was it that they were seeking? Who were these people and what was it that they wanted? And they wanted the same thing that anybody who's ever crossed the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Rio Grande wanted, we're which is talk freedom. We're about this dichotomy between was it push or pull, what made it happen and what was the result in the North as well as in the South. But let me first take you back to what you first thought when the germ of the idea entered your head 
What did you think you were going to do as opposed to what 15 years later you wound up having done? Well, this, the idea for the book came in many, many different ways while I was growing up. You might even say I've been writing it all my life because I'm the daughter of people who are part of this migration. Uh, once I decided I wanted to do this, I realized that there was no grapes of wrath for this great migration. Six million people, you know, migrating within the borders of our own country, and there was no uh, there was no great narrative to express the uh, actual journey itself. And, and yet you didn't set out were. to write a novel. I didn't set out to write a novel. I wanted to do it in nonfiction because I wanted people to know that this was true, it was real, it happened. There were real people who were affected by this. I wanted to do, I always knew it would be three people who would follow three different trajectories of this migration, the East Coast migration, Midwest, and then out to the West. But you start off interviewing, could this possibly be true, 1,200? I did. I interviewed those uh, that number of people in an audition that was a casting call to find the people who would be the three protagonists in the book. In other words, it was a search for the characters who would be the book. And that was why I interviewed so many people. I went to, to senior centers. I went to uh, Baptist churches in New York, where everybody's from South Carolina. I went to Catholic churches in, in LA, where everybody's from Louisiana. I went to church. There are actually clubs in the North uh, where, that, where everyone is from Mississippi, in, but they're actually living in Chicago. So they have these Mississippi clubs. And so I went to all those places in search of these three people who would make this story come alive and allow people to see themselves on the journey with them. Frequently, we have a lot of heat on this set, and I don't want this to be a gushing <laughs> interview. But Sandy pointed out that it's not a novel, but it reads like a novel in the sense that you focus on the stories. Yeah. And what I went back and looked at after Sandy said, we got you to come here, <laughs> is that uh, look at places like, for example, where you stop to tell about the, the, the black codes, the, mm -hmm. the codes that were sort of the, the post-reconstruction codes that really enforced segregation. And you manage to weave it in in a way that doesn't break the storyline. That I suppose that's why it took 13 years to write the book. But how conscious was that effort of putting in enough historical background so that people would understand the stories and the context in which they fit? I wanted people to be able to see themselves in these people and to imagine themselves in that circumstance and to think to themselves, what would I have done? What would I have done had I been living in a world in which it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to just play checkers together? What would I have done if I were living in a world in which there was actually a black Bible and a white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in a courtroom? What would I have done if I were in a world where an African American could not even pass a white driver on the road no matter how slowly that person was going. What would I have done? And on top of that, what would I have done in a world in which every four days a person who looked like me would be, was, was lynched for some perceived breach of the caste system that I've just described? And so I wanted people to be able to imagine what it was like. So they needed to first identify with the protagonist, which is your route into the story. And then the, you, I think I, people need to know what was that world like. I think we think we know what it's like, but it's hard to imagine the daily, moment-to-moment -moment sense of oppression and constriction that they experienced from the moment they woke up until the time that they went to sleep as a result of the many, many rules and laws and the walls that were there that kept people apart. And unlike some traditional historians, who have looked at innovations in technology for picking cotton and, and the, the, the state of the job market, you make the case for those things that you've just described being far more important for getting people onto those um, trains in the back of those uh, trucks and walking and however it is they get out of the South, far more important in the decision to go. Well, in some ways, uh, talking to so many people was useful. And in a way, I, it was like going to school myself. I was hearing so many stories that I got validation for and got an understanding of how, on the whole, people were viewing the world that they were living in. And I think it's reflective of how difficult life was for them, the fact that they didn't tell or share their stories with their own children and grandchildren. When they left, they left for good, and they didn't look back, and they didn't want to talk about it. In fact, one of the most difficult interviews that I had was with my own mother, who absolutely did not want to talk about it. When I began uh, working on the book, she said, well, that's, that's old history, that's in the past. When I left, I left for good, and she did not want to talk but about it. But then she becomes part of the process with you. 
reluctantly. And I ended up, and uh, the only way that she ended up beginning to talk, and she hasn't really fully told me everything even to this day, uh, was that I started to read the book to her. I read the book to her, and she started to, at, at times she began to interject things about what was going on, just little things, and she would kind of catch herself. But it's a reflection of how difficult their, their experience had been. It was a kind of post-traumatic stress syndrome that we don't often think about uh, for Americans in this, in this country. In an age in which the, the political watchword of our era is terror, uh, the idea of lynching as the hard edge of terror in the South uh, is clearly part of our history. What is your sense about how important that was as a driving force that caused people to overcome a normal attachment to home? Well, there are many people who, uh, I, I, of the 1,200 people that I talked to, almost all of them had some, some recollection of something. The, the idea of someone being killed, someone that they knew, was such a common experience that it was a part of the landscape, one historian said. If you were African American, you were more than likely to have known someone who had been. There, were, there was someone in the book who described being eight years old and having to go out with his uncle on an errand, and the errand was to actually cut down a person who had been lynched from a tree. And so this was this goes seeps into the memories of, of an entire generation of people who did not talk about it because those are traumatic, terrorizing moments that one would not want to think about if they didn't have to, and it happened in this country. And of course, once they got to the north and their children went to school, um, what they tended to learn about slavery was some sanitized figment of the imagination. So the children may not have been getting it at home, and they definitely weren't getting it in, in, the, in the public space. I think that one of the things that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is necessary to think about with this is that we're not talking about slavery. We're talking about 20th century life in our country. Which gets completely, completely obliterated in the narrative as told through schools. It's not discussed. In fact, the Great Migration You hear about Martin itself. Luther King? You might hear about 1954. I mean, there are a few iconic moments. And other than that, well, you know, and maybe you know that there was a Ku Klux Klan, but that was a long time, long ago. time ago. And of course, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. This is in the lifespan of the majority of people who are alive today. We're not talking ancient history. We're talking 20th century. We're talking well into the 1970s, where the South was still very reluctant and slow, in fact, fitfully dif difficult uh, adjustment to these new, to finally the changes that occurred as a result of the Civil Rights Acts of 64, 65, and 68. One of the subtly intriguing things about the book is the sense in which the people from the South came here and brought the South with them. And yes. this is mirrored in my grandmother's home in terms of food, in terms of language. Uh, there were big arguments about why you call Black Eyed Peas Hop and John, yeah. I mean, those kinds of things. <laughs> but And in fact, you, you, you tell a story about one of the characters who won't change a recipe until she goes back to the South yes. and comes back. What, what is your sense about how deeply it was important that the South came with the folks who came from the South? I think the fact that they, they brought the South with them was in some ways uh, a reinforcement of how in some ways this is an unrecognized immigration within the borders of our own country. Just as people who left Italy coming to the United States brought with them uh, pieces of the old country, so did the people in this migration. And so the people who were born in the North and raised by these people were in some ways raised by Southerners, as was I, and they were in some ways Southerners once removed. So let me ask you, one, po one of the points you make in the book that's very interesting is the extent to which the first generation of black mayors in the North, yes. Carl Stokes, Harold Washington, were not people who had been in the North but were the children of Southerners coming out. What's up with that? What is the significance of that? That's because Remember, this is New Jersey, very when, political yeah, states. When, when, people, when people migrate, <coughs> David Dinkins, for example, right. too. For, uh, uh, when people migrate, immigrants or people who migrate in this way, failure is not an option. They're leaving because they are seeking something. They're seeking freedom. They're seeking something better than what they had wherever they happened to have been before. And so failure is not an option. And there's a drive within them. Some of the most ambitious people to, mi to, to be in any particular place will be those who have actually migrated there because they have chosen to be there. And when these people chose to be there, they, were, they actually ended up becoming the first African-American leaders or mayors in many of these cities, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Detroit in Cleveland, in New York, in Chicago. The first black mayors of all of those cities happen to have been the children of migrants, or many of them have been migrants themselves. Willie Brown in San Francisco <coughs> actually picked cotton himself in Texas. But, you know, that idea of what these migrants brought to the North 
and the differences between them and the people who had been north is at some variance with the more traditional idea that you had um, the uncouth masses coming from the south, bringing down the northern cities, creating dysfunction in, in families, in the economy, in the streets, bringing crime. You say, no, that, that's not the correct picture. Well, actually, the new data that's come out of the census and that sociologists are now beginning to do as they begin to parse that data has found that the exact opposite is the case, that, in fact, many of them were forced to live in the, in the uh, red light districts of the cities that they went to, and that meant that they were then, uh, they were then forced to live among vi the vice uh, and uh, prostitution and all those kinds of things that they had not been seeking to, and they were not permitted to leave because if they tried to buy someplace else, they were running into restrictive covenants and other efforts that were made to keep them segregated here in the North. And so they were then, they were then uh, 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 connected to a world that they had arrived to but had not themselves created, and they actually sought to get out as quickly as they could. Many of these people were Southern church-going family people, ultimately. And they were very hard workers because all they had known was work back where they were from. And failure is not an option. And so when they when they got a chance to leave, that's what they sought to do. But they had very they had a lot of barriers to even that. But we do know what happened in cities like Newark, where we're from, and Jersey City. And mm -hmm. At what point, or was there a point, at which the children or the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of these people got eaten by the very cities that perhaps they had been helpful to when they first arrived. You're absolutely right. One of the things that in a migration is that there's a tremendous sense of dislocation. You're, you're, you're gaining uh, the, the, the hope for freedom but you're also losing the community that you that raised you and, and, and embraced you before. They were arriving in places where they had to work, they had to leave their children alone in these red light districts to which they had been consigned to live. And you can see that it makes perfect sense that those children unattended are not going to be able to, are not necessarily going to be able to protect themselves against the vices that they're surrounded by. And it's a, it's a sad, tragic reality that that was one of the trade-offs that had to have been made for them to be free. There are many, many people, the majority of African Americans, in spite of all of that, the majority of African Americans work. The majority of African Americans love their children and want the best for their children, like any other group of people in this country or the world. And so there are, there are going to be people who will suffer under the circumstances that they found themselves. And the other thing is that because of the segregation that had been created uh, and, the, and the flight from the cities, uh, that left a core of people who were least likely to be able to maintain an infrastructure that was crumbling even before they arrived. So you can see the, how all of these things came together to almost create the worlds that we now see. Let me put a little bit of an edge on our gushing experience with you, because both of us really <laughs> love this book. I actually heard you speak um, before I'd finished the book, and it was a racially mixed oh, audience. And you were talking a great deal about comparisons of the Great Migration to the European immigration experience. And I guess my thought at the time was whether you were doing that in a way, uh, trying to be inclusive to an audience and make people feel included in the experience, and how much le intellectual legitimacy was there to the comparison. Has that challenge been raised to you? Has that question no. been asked of whether or not you were straining to make that comparison? No. Or is that a comparison but that flowed no naturally that, from That comparison work? flows naturally from my own core and experience, because when I was growing up, I felt like a first-generation person of people who had immigrated from someplace else. And I found that when I went to school, I gravitated toward people who were first generation. In other words, we were all going through the sim similar things. We were all in a, in a so-called mainstream world in which there were certain norms and expectations. And then we were returning home to places where we were eating different food. The language of, of my parents was a little slightly different. The accents were different. I, the expectations were very different, meaning that my parents' expectations were, in fact, higher. They were stricter. There was no way that they could allow their daughter to fail after all that they had been through. And that's very much attached to the immigrant experience, which is so legendary in our country. In other words, this is about the agency of a people, the lowest caste people in our country, who for the first time in large numbers decided for the first time where they would live and what they would do for a living. That had never happened in the history of our country, if you think about it. And it's a long time you're talking and about. And it's a long 1915 to 1970s. This that is they were making this decision. Generations. generations. It's about agency and the ability to make a decision for oneself. And not everybody's experience is going to turn out as they had hoped, but at least they had made the leap of faith 
to do what they felt was best for them and their family, and that's what it's ultimately about, and that's what, what all Americans share, actually. We've clarified that this um, is not a novel, and yet, as Raymond said, it sure reads like one. And you have three main characters, and if you had made them up, you could not have made them more perfectly <laughs> in order to show the similarities and the differences in class, in, um, in, in their own expectations for what they would find, and in fact, what they did find. So Ida Mae, Robert George, can you give me 10 seconds on each? Who, who were these people, and why do we come to love them all so much? Ida Mae Brandon Gladney is the first to leave in 1937. She's a sharecropper's wife in Mississippi. Uh, she has the uh, distinction of having been terrible at picking cotton, which I find itself in, endearing because it but shows you that it's not... But wants to take at the end with you. She does because it some way, somehow triggers some memory, ancient memory in her when she's in her 80s and we go back. She ends up with her family leaving uh, actually with great difficulty. It was not easy to leave, meaning it was not... You couldn't tell people you were leaving. She said you don't tell people you're leaving until you're gone because people because the South did not make it easy for them to leave. They would arrest people from the railroad platforms and, and make it very difficult. And they went to Chicago in 1937. The second person to leave was a man who had been in Florida. He'd gone to a couple years of school. Uh, the money ran out, and he ended up having to return to the work of the people in that part of Florida that he was from, which was picking citrus fruit. The work was dangerous, and the pay was terrible, and he attempted to try to get the people to band together for better work conditions. For having done that, he ran smack into the caste system, which meant that it was not acceptable for African Americans to uh, challenge or even at request uh, better work conditions. And there was a plot to lynch him, and he had to flee for his life, and he went to New York in 1945. And then the third person was a surgeon, Dr. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster, and he migrated from uh, Louisiana to California because it turned out that he'd been a surgeon in the Army and could practice surgery there, but he couldn't practice surgery in his own hometown of Monroe, Louisiana. So he set off on this perilous journey to try to get to California. He goes by car. By car in an era in which African Americans, many of us have don't never knew and others have not thought about the fact that uh, black African Americans could not be assured of a place to sleep or a place to get gas or food uh, or any other facilities while they were on the road, and that it was, a, it was a perilous journey because he had to drive for so far without being able to sleep. Sandy, kidnapped you from Douglas, and we don't have the time to ask all the questions <laughs> we want to ask, but I did want to ask you a little bit about the difference between the World War I and the World War II uh, influxes, because they were really, uh, as you pointed out, one great migration, but a number of phases. Did you look or have a chance to focus at all on differences between the experiences of the, the World War II generation as opposed to the World War I generation? I, I'm very proud to say that actually uh, I actually interviewed people who migrated during World War I. I. Someone told me when I started, oh, you'll never find anybody from World War I. I actually did. A man had been born in 1900, uh, and he'd actually served in the war. Uh, there were there were not as... I didn't find as many distinctions among these as, as others have, have said. I, I found them to all have experienced a, sen a general era or epoch in our history in which generally African Americans were being treated the same throughout much of that time, and that all of them were seeking the same thing. The earlier waves would have been more pioneering, and the others would have been following cousins and younger brothers and sisters, following aunts and uncles who were up here in the North. But ultimately, I view it as one long train of people seeking freedom. Well, this is a book with over 600 pages, and so it's That's not surprising. That's including the notes. That's including the notes. <laughs> but, but the I notes wish, are worth reading. But if it was 1,200 pages, I would have read it. It was really a wonderful read. We have to apologize for being so nice and in love with you, but your work was fantastic. <laughs> but that also means that one half hour just gets us started. Isabel Wilkerson, you'll have to come back. And for now, Isabel, we thank you for coming. We thank you for writing that extraordinary book, and we thank you for watching. This week and every week for the kind of social and legal justice issues that get too little of the public air and the public eye, the kind of issues that are linked and too often informed by the history we've been talking about today. So please, come back next week.
Did you focus at all on differences between the experiences of the, the World War II generation as opposed to the World War I generation? I, I'm very proud to say that actually uh, I actually interviewed people who migrated during World War I. I. Someone told me when I started, oh, you'll never find anybody from World War I. I actually did. A man had been born in 1900, uh, and he'd actually served in the war. Uh, there were there were not as... I didn't find as many distinctions among these as, as others have, have said. I, I found them to all have experienced a, sen a general era or epoch in our history in which generally African Americans were being treated the same throughout much of that time and that all of them were seeking the same thing. The earlier waves would have been more pioneering and the others would have been following cousins and younger brothers and sisters following aunts and uncles who were up here in the north but ultimately I view it as one long train of people seeking freedom. <laughs> Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch us on demand on YouTube. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy.